There we go. All right. Um, looks like. Hey, Ed. Hey. Sorry hey, about that. No problem. Good. All right. <laughs> no problem. I'm multitasking too. So. <laughs> yeah. I think I got a lot of stuff going on, and then, uh, um, and then apparently it just I, I thought I brought up the right one, but I guess I didn't. So, um, for some reason I also checked specifically not to do the um, to let everyone in and not have to invite them in, but um, that's not the case. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna have to let everyone in one by one. <laughs> yeah. Normally, no problem. I thought I could change that, but I didn't. So, um, so it looks like so far we have Charlie, Jonathan, um, Sean O'Brien, Zeke, John Heaton. Uh, we have a few more people I know that are coming in that have uh, uh, helped out by saying, "Hey, uh, there's the link's not working." <laughs> yeah, well, so, just. Well, you can just chill for five minutes while you hopefully invite more people in. Yep, we're getting people coming in, so uh, and we're we're in pretty good shape. Um, okay. I do have a good good group on Facebook Live. They'll be able to just type in any questions they have. Um, so uh, looks like Travis can't make the Zoom, so we don't have him. But that's, that's part of the world today I think. all right so you're just going to read the questions as come in and fire them off to us if you think they're relevant yeah well yeah and i'll just kind of get those going and and i think the biggest thing is is it you know getting you know you guys to just do a quick you know whatever you want to share and yeah. i think that's the important thing and then from that that'll draw questions and then i'll i'll have some questions too um about the only so we have a pretty good group of people in right now. So um, we're in pretty good shape. So why don't we just start? Um, Charlie, what, if you just want to do a, just a real quick, you know, start to uh, the whole uh, Zoom and just give us, you know, your quick, and then we'll go from there, quick um, thoughts of the weekend and and how everything was and, and that type of thing. So Charlie McKee, go for it and give us um, just a quick, um, you know, However, you want to intro and that lead the way for everyone else. Uh, yeah, well, I don't really want to intro other than to thank you for uh, helping to make it happen. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the obviously it's, you know, it's it's been interesting and challenging times and challenging to plan ahead for people and, you know, do what we can to, you know, be safe, but still try to do what we love. So um i think we all are feeling fortunate you know big picture and small picture wise to be able to have been in the position that we could go sailing and uh it is a reminder you know a how lucky we are and b sort of what are the things that matter and for us to go race with and against our friends and go be able to sail like that all the rest of the stuff you know the scores is it a real regatta everything else you know it just shows how unimportant all of that is so yeah. you know i think we're all just sort of you know i mean thanking you but mostly just thanking each other for you know being able to have the chance to do that so that was pretty cool Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. And I think one of the big things that I heard people say was um, that, uh, you know, the race course just seemed different because, you know, people just, you know, they were having fun, they're enjoying themselves. And, you know, if there was a, a closer call, you know, people were a lot more lenient and understand. And, and even though people did get fired up around marks and things, you know, you know, in the middle of the race course, it, it was just a little, little different, a little better. So, I think that was a good thing. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you, Charlie. Um, I, I appreciate that, number one. I'm gonna go on to the next person and I'm gonna say, um, you know, I'm not here to, to do anything for myself. I'm here to do things for the J70 class. And uh, please uh, just focus on that. Um, I appreciate everybody, but let's uh, try to share some information, um, you know, on settings and things like that. Um, 
I, I have Zeke in the middle of my screen right now, so I'm going to go to Zeke. And Zeke, you guys were flying on the last day. Um, I'm not. I don't know if you led the first mark in both races in either race, but you won both races on the last day. I know it was maybe lighter than even raceable, but we all got to practice in that. So Zeke, can you just give us, you know, your last last day and what you're doing um, to make your boat go so fast? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thanks. Well, we, yeah, we didn't lead in the, the second race on Sunday. We were coming from behind, but yeah, we managed to have a good run and a good second beat and come back and, and, uh, and sneak by a couple, but you know, we were there on Thursday. We sailed really hard on Thursday with a tuning partner and a coach. And we sailed again on Friday and a little shorter day with it being so light. And we definitely had our moments of brilliance and our moments of not being particularly special. So we were just really focused on having a steep, uh, steep learning curve. And we definitely applied a lot of our lessons that we learned on those first three days to, to Sunday and kind of put it all together and came out feeling pretty good about it. And I think it was a really big reminder of how important it is to be thinking venue specific when you get to these different venues that we get to, that we're fortunate enough to race in all over the country and the world. They're all unique they're all really different and they all require some different things. So with Davis Island, usually it's light. <laughs> um, we've seen some windy days, but I think everybody kind of prepares for light air. Um, more importantly, it's the flattest water venue. I think you could pretty much ever race in unless it's blowing out of the South, you get a little bit of short chop, but anything else that's coming over land and it's dead flat water. So some things to think about when you're sailing in dead flat water that you might do a little differently. A big one for us is, was, was learning that you can't go too loose on the rig. I think that you get to a point where when you loosen your, certainly your uppers too much, the mass just gets too straight. And especially in the really light stuff, you just don't have enough pre-bend to flatten your main and be able to hit a top speed as well as um, trimming really hard. So, and that kind of goes hand in hand. If your mast is too straight uh, and your main is too full, you can't pull the main in as hard without the leech shutting down. So keeping a little bit of extra rig tension on, um, it, it was, you know, zero to four knots at times. And we were down uh, only one and one from base, where if there was a little bit of lump, we might've been down two and two or even three and two sometimes. So a little bit of extra rig tension helps keep the sails a little bit flatter, lets you trim, trim the sails harder. And that was kind of the other one is uh, how hard you really could trim the sails. I know the guys that won were really trimming their mains super hard and I think that was important because it let the the bow kind of climb to weather when those little puffs hit like the, the another venue specific thing for davis island is the puffs kind of roll down really um privately and they're not for for everybody and so when you had yours you really needed to, to take all the height that you could get to get some leverage and get to the next one so it was important um you know to, to quickly let the bow climb up and you needed your sails trimmed pretty hard to do that as opposed to, you know, if it was the same amount of breeze, but choppy, you would take that puff and you'd take it forward, trying to get as much speed on as you could and get to the next shift that way. But it's a, a Davis Island specific thing is taking all the height. So um, the last big takeaway that we had was kind of counterintuitive to what we've been learning all year, but just not sailing the boat too dead flat. And I think it goes to the same exact thing that I was just talking about with a little bit of extra heel on the boat. Um, you were, it just, the boat was, had an easier time taking height when you got the little bit of extra pressure and puff. So, um, if, it, if not everybody has a heel indicator on their screen, I would definitely recommend it. It's a, it's hugely important for all the conditions, I think both upwind and downwind. So that was kind of our thoughts. Sorry if that went a little long. No, that's perfect. Um, actually I got a question and, and I'm going to go right at it because it makes sense. Can you tell us which sails you're using? Sure. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So the North okay. sails, um, North sails, the F1 mainsail and the J2 high clue jib is our kind of sails of choice, which are not, I, I think, you know, the, the, for the North sails, the F1 is the flat one. The J6 is the flatter jib. So it was kind of a, you know, we, we kind of spend the weekend trying to make sure we can get our jib flat enough to kind of have that flatter jib J6 look with the J2 high clue, which is definitely achievable. Um, and then I'm going to shift over to John real quick. So John, um, I know you've been sailing with Zeke and, and Zach and, and, uh, and Phil there a bunch. Um, and I also know you guys, you know, have a very good ability to keep it light off the water, but what's it like on the water sailing with these guys and, and, you know, how much is the communication, um, like the style of it and that type of thing? 
Uh, well, it's it's we we always have fun together. Um, you know, I, I try to remind these guys. I know they're all pros, and I pay them. But um, you know, it's important that we have fun. And uh, if we're if we're collectively not having fun on the water, I won't. I'll quit. I mean, I don't I don't want to do it. Um, so we keep things pretty light. Sometimes things get tight, tense, but we try to make sure you know at the end we're. Uh, we're being positive with each other as much as possible. So I think the communication reflects that on the water. Um, so pretty open communication on the boat. Um, I, you know, Zeke, in terms of the last day, I mean, Zeke did a masterful job keeping us in pressure. But I, part of what happens in that is that uh, the other two crew members, uh, Zach and Felder, both Zach Mason and Will Felder provide a lot of feedback to Zeke, and it's never in the in the manner of we better do this, Zeke. It's more big picture, and they're constantly providing feedback to Zeke. It ultimately, it's his call about what to do. But a good feature of our boat is, is that trust in each other. Um, you know, um, sometimes I feel like I'm kind of along for the ride, <laughs> but I, I think you know I've learned a lot from those guys as well. From my focus as an owner. With these guys has been about trying to learn from them and and not just focusing on results is for you know what am i learning as a you know as part of this team and just so i can be a contributor to the team so yeah perfect that's awesome um and you chose a tuning partner i think one thing you know is important is you know having a tuning partner so you know what the plan is every day especially practices leading up yeah, I mean, we had uh, we we tuned with Buddy Cribs Boat Victory, um, and you know, I think having a tuning partner with the coach uh, really was valuable. I mean, we struggled on Saturday, um, and I think having the feedback from both a conversation with a dedicated tuning partner and our coach, uh, we were a lot better on. I mean, we were pretty quick on Sunday because you know we we innovated or responded to some of the observations that also came from our tuning partners. I think that's having that camaraderie with another team is I think super valuable as well. And also just talking to each other on the dock is super, you know, it's harder to do now. That's something I really miss. Um, but it, having that ability, I think is, is a great thing. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, so, um, one real quick question from uh, from Sean O'Brien uh, here is what what were your big changes between just Saturday to Sunday? I don't know. You want to? I... Sure. Um, well, the biggest one is we we weren't as distracted by that group of lady sunfish that was sailing over off the beach. There, we felt it was really important to sail into a very large hole on Saturday to go hang out with them. It was not not super quick. Um, but the, the wind was certainly different. So we, we were able to be more accurate on Sunday with our kind of strategy and tactical decisions for sure. As John said, it's a team effort. Um, that was really, really big. Uh, otherwise we were more aggressive with our uh, jib lead movement. Um, we kind of were able to use our tuning partner and our coach to learn what some other teams were doing on the Friday and Saturday. And it seemed like there was a pretty big range of what was going on with jib leads and the depth at the bottom of the jib versus uh, where the, the upper leech on the spreader was. And it just has to be such a big range when you're in that kind of extreme condition with the really flat water. So when you're in the, you know, the zero to four side of things where you can't get enough power at all and everybody's, you know, hiking to lured basically, uh, we found it was very beneficial to push the lead um, artificially far forward. I mean, to like four holes showing or three, three holes showing at times with no inhaler. And that way you could carry lots of power in the jib down low, but the top of the jib was wide open for power. And then as soon as we got to the five knot side of things, we were shifting the cars back to that more normal five and a half or six holes um, showing and, and getting the inhaler involved in flattening things out. So um, that was big. And the other big one was the heel thing that we talked about. It's something our team's focused on really hard lately is sailing the boat very, very flat in all conditions as flat as we can take it. and. I think that we learned that we might have gone a little too far with that in this venue where, like I said, it was, you know, John was so good at driving the boat on Sunday by letting the bow climb uh, when those puffs hit and those lifts came. Whereas on Saturday, the bow was slower to come up. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that we were trying to sail too flat. So 
On Saturday, our goal was to be in the sort of six to nine degrees of heel. And Sunday we said, we're not gonna take it any flatter than 10 degrees of heel. And uh, we were more like, you know, between 10 and 15 degrees and the boat was just a bit more lively and we were able to put it where we wanted more easily. I think that was, that was a big change. Thank you. Um, we'll shift over to Jonathan. Jonathan, um, you guys sailed with Bruno and, um, you know, I know you, you sailed your brother as well. So, you know, you guys, uh, I, you know, I noticed you guys had pretty consistent sailing, but then also on the last, um, day, it actually looked like, you know, you were put, you were in some bad spots, bad luck, that type of thing, but then you move forward a lot. So, you know, how do you keep your team going? You know, when you're one, it's only practice. And two, you know, it's just, you realize the bigger picture. So Jonathan, can you kind of, that's kind of the thing I think maybe focus on first and then you can share anything else, but. Yeah, you bet. Thought? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, it was, uh, as uh, Sadiq alluded to, the wind can be quite localized. So you'd sort of have your turns and then you'd have your times when it wasn't your turn. And, um, you know, you, I think with the more mature teams, everybody knows that and you just kind of sail through the good times and the bad and <laughs> hope that it all ends well at the windward mark, you know. Um, and, you know, we try to keep it pretty calm and, um, you know, it's everybody can sort of see what's going on and, you know, sometimes you have to, I think it was in this regard, sometimes tack in places that weren't perfect, you know, and kind of compromise that just to be going towards the next pressure. Um, and I think the other big lesson that I learned on the last day was really not get stuck. In, if it's like under five knots, just pick one edge or the other on, on both upwinds and hope it's the right one. Um, but any sort of up the middle action in the really wide air is, is probably a, a no go. So, uh, and I really want to also um, echo what's been said about the heel angle. I do think that is critical. And I, I see teams trying to sail too flat um, and just struggling to keep the bow up. Yeah. That's yeah. it for me. Thanks a All lot right, for thank you, one last thing. Um, yeah. The Mark bot thing was amazing. And there's no way we would have got five races in on Saturday without that. Um, combined with the good communication and the good course setting and everything. So that was an incredible tribute to that technology, I think. And thanks for putting it on display um, in such an obvious way to our benefit. Thank you, Jonathan. That was definitely something that, you know, we wanted to be able to do just to be able to get these regattas off because, you know, in, a, in an event like this, the race committee numbers are, are pretty big. You know, we're talking about you know, 20 plus people on the email I got um, from the race committee. And so, you know, that makes makes us sailing right now a little more difficult. So it is a pretty cool technology that we're lucky to have. So um, I know we'll be seeing that more at, at Bacardi where we're running it and some other events that we're, we're going to be running them with. But um, I think that is our future. Um, I have a couple of coaches on here. Um, George, how are you? Where's Mr. Zabo? Mr. Zabo, I, I, I got the, 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 the luxury of being able to hang out with George all weekend um, and run the races. And um, I would like to see if George would just shoot in there on some things. There's some people talking about flatter means and how do you tell when the telltale, you know, you know when, when it's stalling or not stalling. Um, George, are you there? You could give us some insight about some of the things we saw between the different different sale setups and what seemed to work and didn't work? Yeah, ab absolutely. We had a pretty unique uh, week where the two guys I was coaching had never been in J70 before. And we had to figure out how J70 turned and how it reacted and how to get up to speed and building new teams at the same time. So you know, some of that initially was copying our way to the top to figure out what you could rest you guys are up to. And as they went on, they found essentially, like you said, the same super flat, super sheeted hard, J, uh, Tampa Bay tuning and um, you know it works great in that flat water and you're getting bumps in racing I had to work at getting them eased back out so from there we kind of had gears we had an up gear which was dead flat and we had a 
of eased out reachy gear that looked more like what you could live in the lane with or live in traffic with. And that was, we worked on that main trim and we worked on that jib shape. And, you know, like Zeke had said, it was super critical to get that lead in the right spot and using, you know, under four knots, it was pretty tough. They had to pop the inhaler, move the lead way forward and then bring the inhaler back on. And so as we got set up, we got pretty full on the bottom. And I think we had pretty good advantage with that full bottom jib. Um, you know, from there it was, you know, focusing on getting the boat handling going and keeping the communication going. And, you know, as Jonathan said, Tampa windshifts are pretty rough. And so we just kind of made a point of saying, hey, watch out, you get Tampa windshifted out there and made it like, you know, if it, if it happens, just keep the attitude light. Um, don't worry about it. Just try to figure out how to get back in there. So that was kind of what we focused on and um, how we had the two gears. And then um, they really focused on the heel angle. And, you know, I think it was more nine degrees that they were working on. But uh, that was, you know, a big factor. You know, a few lucky times at the start, getting off the start line and a good spot helped out. And um, it's most of it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let's see. I got a question here from inside the group. Can you talk about their team's starting process prior to the start sequence? So um, did you guys go over that, uh, George? Yeah, uh, the first day of uh, practice, we gave him one buoy and let him sail up to the buoy and stop the boat and get it going again and just worked on that for about half an hour, 45 minutes, just to how does the darn boat react to the buoy? And from there, then we started to do what everyone else is doing and, um, you know, try to approach the line and how long does it take to go 20 meters on the line? And so we got from there and then, um, you know, they're on their own during the regatta. They didn't have enough, enough start practice. And so what I noticed the um, our fast boat, they ended up at the boat end a lot, making sure they can get out of Dodge if they had issues. Um, and yeah, you know, they got really lucky sometimes. They uh, got up to the line, got too far advanced, were able to tack out in front of everybody. And because the Markbot wasn't a committee boat, they could get away from the line and get back in. And so it was a little bit of a game changer to be able to get out of Dodge at the weather end when they had issues. So I think they got you know, just great breaks off the start line a few times. Yeah, I think one thing we even talked about when we were on the water is, you know, you can't really get stuck in the middle. I think Jonathan mentioned that too. And so, you know, you got to be able to either bail out or go straight to get to where the clear air is. And you know, we definitely noticed some times where we're like, oh, well, the right's going to be the way to go or the left's going to be the way to go. But then you see some guys that stayed in clear air the whole time, you know, that went the other way. So I think when you get to big fleets in, in certain areas, you know, getting stuck in the middle is death. Um, going fast is really the key. Yeah, and just being able to foot to that next shift if you can in Davis Island. Yep, definitely. Uh, Mike Ingham, can you jump in real quick on some of these comments? Um, Mike had a team um, that he was coaching, and so he was out there um, helping us a lot as well. We, we were definitely lucky that all the coaches, you know, chipped in uh, to help call the line and do other things. Um, and the benefit, of course, of this regatta was then the coaches could really coach as well. Um, so Mike, did you work on anything specific starting wise with your team? Uh, so my first comment on that is I called the line, I think three of the races and, you know, the people that are over and even if they weren't over, if they didn't have good starts, even though they were near the line, if they got to the line too soon, if they set up too close. So the teams that were struggling were setting up too close or too far. And if they were too far, they couldn't get there. If they were too close, they had to slow down right before they got to the line or be over. And then even though they were pretty close to the line, if they weren't over, you know, people that accelerated behind them just shot right by them like they were stopped because they were stopped. So I think that was, you know, I think in watching the starts, probably 10 boats a race were too soon to the line and had issues because of that. Um, I think what our team had a little bit of trouble with that. And, and what we ended up doing was saying with 30 seconds to go, you got to decide if you're early and you got to slow down. Then a lot of teams were slowing down at 10 seconds or five seconds and you're never going to get going again. So that was the biggest thing I saw at the start. So I know one of the things we talked about um, with some of the teams is how critical it is to play your um, Jim Hired and your and your, um, your outhaul. And I think, you know, in a starting situation, um, you know, obviously you probably want to be loose. And then as, you know, we talk about this phase where you get out in clear air, where you flatten everything. Um, Charlie, 
do you want to talk about, um, you know, how often your team, you know, did play around with those, um, those controls? Yeah. Um, I guess the, uh, the main feeling from our team was just keep the boat moving at all times. <laughs> um, what uh ask me something a little more a little more sort of specific i guess uh so were, were you a lot looser on your jib hired and and cunningham during the or and your out hall during pre-start and starting in the race i think you know what zeke you know said about oh, oh we think that you know we can set up this way and we want to be powerful and we want to sail the boat flat and you know we always talk about we want to come off the line with everything exactly right um and the what what argues against that is sort of the not screw it up and get down speed and have a really hard time getting back up to speed so i think that the the what we ended up doing that was more successful is just sort of start with the traveler a little lower, the main sheet a little looser, everything a little twistier, um, and lean against the jib a tiny bit more and build up speed and then say, okay, can we or can we not hang in this lane? So we definitely didn't set up to pinch off the line, I would say. We were more just like try to get the boat up to four, four and a half knots if we could, um, and then figure out what to do about it. Yep. Perfect. I, I think most most of the time, and, and uh, you know, Mike said it and George said it, I think like most of the time, you're just like, it's either going okay or it's not going okay. And you know, you don't have to wait until the start to know that. Um, and I guess the more we went along, the more we just try to, you know, make things easy on ourselves and set up, you know, forward to leeward on the weight, twisty on the sails and try to make it a little easier to drive. Okay, awesome. Um, Zeke, I'll go back to you on, on, on this one. Do you guys, like, we have the range of, you know, all of your controls. What would you consider the range of your jib hired control to be uh, even in a day like that where it's light? It's moving a lot. I'll say, I'll say definitely it moves a lot and it's one of the most important controls. It's almost like the only control at a certain point that as far as I, I look at it, I mean, when it's so light that your, tra your traveler's all the way up, I don't really mess with the outhaul when once we're sailing. Um, you're not going to be pulling Cunningham or Vang. You're dying to get back stay on, but probably it's too light for that. So it's like your body weight and your jib controls and the halyard is really important. So it moves a ton. Um, it's definitely better to air on looser for that first acceleration coming off the line. And it's getting adjusted a lot, <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't count how many times per leg, but many times per minute, I'd say every little velocity change or, or change in how our boat is going. Uh, you know, it, it, it kind of is like the backstay when you're, you're dying to pull the backstay on at times, you're hoping that it gets windy enough, or you're powered up enough that you can start flattening out with the backstay. It's the same with the jib halyard. So if we're all sitting kind of dead in the boat or, or even hiking to lure it, it's going to be max off to the point where we got the horizontal wrinkles that go back um, to that first seam. And that helps kind of just keep the, the whole sail powered up, the, the, the head open. And then as soon as, you know, we can get a body going to weather, it starts snugging on and adding a little bit more knuckle forward and flattening out for, for higher speed. So it's imperative to be moving a lot. Zach is our jib trimmer, but we have uh, Felder will be the one adjusting it based on what Zach's asking him to do. And it's more than where it is. What's the range you think? Oh, um, it's like on the rope itself, it's probably three to four inches 
of rope as it goes through the cleat. Which and is like uh, an inch. Two to, two to six knots. So it's like an inch on the mast then, probably. Sure. So Yeah, probably something like that. If it's, is it four to one, you know. <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's four to one. We're, we're working on eight to one, but it's four to one right now. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not much, basically, is what it comes down to. It, it's active, but it's only, you know, that much. But it does a lot. Yeah, you know, I think the visual is more important on on the luff itself. And in, no, in normal sailing conditions, I'd say that if the wrinkles are going, the, the horizontal wrinkles are going past that first seam, it's too loose. And so we're really looking there. It, it might be more range than that in the on the rope itself or on the mast. Um, but it's really it's going from how far back those horizontal wrinkles are to starting to smooth them out and then there, there's another visual associated up at the you know the upper leech on the spreader bars but that's that's for a jib trimmer to answer <clears throat> so george i'm actually gonna go to you on this because we were looking at it uh and we could see that so there, obviously you have a view of on the boat and a view of off the boat um that are sometimes a lot different but george we were looking at spreaders and you know, it, tell us where people are trimming to on the spreaders. Uh, lines on most boats, no matter what sails you have, are going to be like 18, 20, and 22 is where the stripes are on the spreaders. George, what were we seeing there um, with the different boats and how much they're trimming versus not trimming in different conditions? So you know, tight setting was the inside mark. Typically, we're trying to be middle mark or just inside the middle mark. But what we're really focusing on was the X angle of that middle stripe. We wanted to have that just a touch hooked up with the mid stripe or, or a little bit straight back. And you know, we didn't want to be open in a depowered situation because we're just trying to get power in that jib. We're trying to get a little more roundness matching the roundness from the bottom of the jib to the middle of the jib um, to get that full. Because just, you know, any, any boat you get in light air, if you get a full bottom jib and you can hook up the middle each a little bit, you're going to get more power. So that's where we're really focusing on. And if the guys had their inhaler too loose, we couldn't get there. So you know, as we got back in the fleet and hollers were a little bit looser, I think, and sometimes she'd have, you know, maybe the same mark, but the jib was a lot flatter without that proper inhaler amount. Yep. If so you inhaler was the leap in the wrong spot, it was it just was got really ugly quickly. It just looked like a parking brake down there. Yep. Yeah, the goal was to try to balance the, the sheet tension with the inhaul tension to get everything that you needed, and that's a, definitely a difficult thing. Um, Jonathan, this, I'm a, go ahead. Sorry, who was that? Oh, uh, just as the weekend went on, we started adding more telltales to the leeches of both sails, just so we could see more on the thing and try to figure figure it out a little. I don't know. I didn't get feedback on the trimmers, but on how that all worked out. But we added a lot more telltales as the weekend went on. Yeah, I think so. Um, definitely. Um, Jonathan, uh, talk to us about level gauges and how important that is to be able to communicate not only with your crew but with you know. Um, obviously your driver and what you're telling him, like how important that level is. Yeah, um, that's a really good question on how to gauge your heel. Um, I prefer the electronic um, measurement if possible, although the bubble gauge will work. It's just a little bit more accurate. And, you know, you're hearing all of us talking about variations of even a couple degrees. So um, I think it's, uh, and that degree of refinement that you get with the electronic is good. Um, so we've been using the Race Geek, which does have it as one of the um, outputs. Um, and I think it's critical downwind as well. Um, you can really get caught, especially two heel to windward as the breeze is going down. Um, and you could end up trying to sail high to, you know, pressurize the kite when you should just um, heel the boat to lure it a little bit more. So um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced it's, uh, it's something to pay close attention to. And then you just tell the driver, you know, where you're working on for right in that exact breeze at that time. And the other thing is in light air, the driver can be a really big part of, the, of what your downwind heel angle is. So especially with bigger drivers, he, they need to sometimes, you know, sit in from their standard position a little bit in order to create the right sort of pre-heel that the trimmer can then work around in, in, to keep the correct heel range. Um, you know, and in more wind, the driver's sitting more out. And, but in the lighter wind, he does, I think, have to hunch in and give the um, spinnaker trimmer something to work with. 
And then what do you do for a gauge um, for your pitch? Or an we app? Look at, we have no electronic pitch um, at all. Oh, in theory, we probably do on the race creek, but we haven't used it. I mean, basically, you're just trying to get as far forward as you possibly can at all times in light air, as, as far as I can tell. And the only thing that's restricting you is the boat handling aspects of it. Yep. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, who else? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> who else do I have on here? Sean O'Brien, how are you? Are you still here? I'm still here. All right, great. So, so you had a, a, a great event. Um, you, you know, we're moving really well. You haven't sailed, I'm guessing, since you know you're up at Harbor Springs. Um, you know, give us just a little report on how you guys, you know, felt you were and what you learned, and you know, I, you know, I think you you were moving. So it was, it was good to see that. And um, you know, what did you do to make that happen? And and how was the chemistry and stuff? Well, first of all, thanks for putting on a great event. I agree with everything that was said about uh, just, you just made it easy and fun for everybody. So thank you for that. Um, you know, we've sailed the same four all last summer. And we, you know, key, uh, key to, I think, our success is just having the same people all the time. Um, Kevin Meyer really sets up the boat really well, very consistently. Um, we used a lot of things everybody else was saying. I think we we were trying to keep the boat a little too flat. We think that on, on Sunday, we think maybe that uh, um, and a little too loose on the rig. So that's, that's really interesting to see, to see, hear you talk about um, um, that there's a limit there because we almost thought there wasn't a limit of how loose you could go, but it, there certainly is. Um, you know, we we also got really lucky on Saturday on a few where we were just constantly in pressure. You, you know, you want to try to stay in one tack the entire time. We would, as soon as we felt the boat go down, we would force ourselves just to tack once or twice, but not more than that, just to stay in pressure all the time. Um, Zeke, I like that comment about um, constantly chasing the shifts up. That's sometimes hard to do because if you chase it too far, the boat, the boat will just stop on you. So keeping that, uh, that balance between um, bringing the bow up exactly when you can, I think we, we gained a ton um, on that. Some other, some other highlights, just smooth around the corners, really trying to keep the boat going at all times. Uh, on the start, um, make, setting up a little farther out with speed going into it as, uh, um, as opposed to close to the line. We got caught a couple times close to the line and it just killed us the, the entire race. So those are, those are sort of some highlights that uh, we, we, we thought helped us this weekend. Yeah, I think that was um, definitely, um, you know, great to see a lot of people just either improving or just sailing well. And, and I think, um, you know, we had a lot of good stuff. Um, I'm going to ask Mike Ingham real quick. One of the things we're talking about with the looseness, and I think what Sean's talking about, how he got a little too loose, is one of the things we saw was, you know, if you get too loose, you can't pull the main sheet on, then your force day gets too sagged. Mike, what were you working on with your team to make sure that they were set up properly? Yeah, they the right balance of making sure we had um... – you know, as part of the real simple thing went, we, we set the rig to what we thought the wind was, and then we, we try it. And you can sort of tell if you're underpowered, overpowered, and, um, and then adjust from there. And then the sanity check was the lured shroud. So if that was flopping around, you're too loose. And the problem with that is if you ever had to use the main sheet, you'd really get too much force stay sag. So that's sort of the right balance is, I think, you know, besides how it feels once you set the rig, uh, we found if the lured shroud was tight, then the, the force stay was too tight. And if the lured shroud was loose, the force stay was too loose. So I think it's pretty basic, but worked well. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And that's a good guide for people. I know the one thing, there's certain boats and, you know, sometimes you want the lured shroud just loose. Sometimes you want it just tight. And, you know, that's just a great guide to be able to, to do that and, and then translate it, um, you know, Checking the force day or the force day sag is hard to see sometimes when you're on the boat. 
So that's that's a good note of thing. Did you guys add any telltales or that type of thing? Yeah. So uh, you know, looking from behind at a lot of boats, the, the the leech telltales told you pretty much everything you wanted to know about the actual trim. I think I think you wanted to trim that jib in pretty dang tight. And I think those references on the, on the spreaders are a good start. You know, like you want to get it close with those and then you got to go take a quick look, especially in that lighter stuff to make sure you weren't over trimmed. I saw a lot of boats come around the lured mark and before they were up to speed, they pull right into whatever they thought their mark was and they'd over trim the jib and it would stall that you, I could tell instantly because they'd stall their leech tail tail. And then until you're up to speed, you can't get that jib in. Um, but the leech tail tail in the main, I thought was pretty interesting too. It was, um, I'm surprised on these boats, how tight in this flat water you could trim them. You know, the top teams were trimming them so that the, you know, that those leech telltales were stalled, you know, 80, 90% of the time. And that that's a lot, that's really tight. Yeah. Yeah. I think that goes with the flat main as well. Um, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's tough. Um, does anyone else have any other guides to share about the four state tension and, and the lure shrouds and that type of thing? Maybe I'll, while people are thinking about that, I'll add to the, the leech telltale thing was, I think Charlie said it right, that, you know, off the line, they weren't worried as much about, you know, making sure the, you know, flopping up the sails with jib halyards and things. I think they were mostly made, I think the key word he said there was twist. And I think, you know, when you're trying to accelerate off the line, you better have that, those telltales flowing a lot more than, you know, that 80, 90% stall, you know, only flowing 10, 20%. Once you're trying to accelerate, you get enough twists in there so that they're flowing like 50% or something as you're trying to get up to speed. Yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. yeah and then the, and the jib had to be cracked a little bit to match that. And I tell you, you could ease that jib too much too. It's super sensitive. You know, I think it's sort of, you know, one or two clicks on the ratchet make a pretty big difference. So I think when you're accelerating, it was only out like five or six clicks at the most, maybe even only three or four. And you only have to bring it in like three or four clicks to get up to speed. I think the trouble with easing it more, you think that's good and like, you know, power up. But the problem was um, that the top of the jib would just start to luff. So you'd kind of lose power. So you had to do it just right. Tiny bit of ease, twist on both sails, bow down just a couple degrees. Can't afford to be reaching down the line or, or even around the marks or anything. Anytime you're trying to accelerate, I think you had to have the, a little bit of twist, telltales flowing like 50% on the main and then click it in just a little bit, click in those last three clicks on the jib as you get up to speed. And that was, it seemed like the, the top teams, that's what they were doing. Yeah. Mike, sure. So the consensus is is um, everything loose as you're getting up to speed and then really strap down in that light air, the jib and? Yeah. And well, yeah, I think it was not just light air. I think it was just flat water. You, you didn't need the power, so you might as well take it in height. And uh, yeah, they were pretty tight leeches. You know, 90% stall is a lot. And the top teams, once they were up to speed, that's what they were doing. But just a tiny bit of twist until you get up to speed though. It's not sustainable, right? If you slow down, you got to twist it a little bit. It was also amazing to see just a little bit of differences in the boat heel. Mm. And what that did for people when they were lined up and not worried too much about, you know, clean air. When there were two boats in clean air and one boat was just a little bit different heel, you'd see what was going faster. Um, and so definitely can't get any reverse heel on that. That was definitely a factor. And I could just jump in real quick with your last question on the, the head stay, head stay sag and the lured shrouds. And I think what Mike was saying is, is brilliant and definitely spot on. But I think what we were talking before is that it, you get to a point where you can keep easing the uppers and you might not even get the uppers to dangle at all when it gets really light. And, you know, this is sort of that extreme condition of that under five knot type stuff. And we've definitely, I think all at one point or another found the edge or you just can keep loosening the rig and, nothing good is happening anymore. And it's just important to realize that it's not only, you know, generating head stay sag by, uh, by easing the, the shrouds, but you're straightening the mass too much. And generally speaking, the J, it's difficult to generate enough pre-bend in the J70 mast. So it's very productive to kind of get a visual on when the upper part of your main, the middle and the upper part of the main is starting to look too full 
and and knuckle forward. If there's too much shape in the forward part of the main near the number two and number three batten, it just starts looking too deep up there. You need to stop easing the uppers and maybe even put some on or just go to ease the lowers. You know, easing the lowers will generate that head stay sag as well. But um, you need enough upper tension on to keep the, the shape further back in the main and just keep it flat enough. So it's a very good idea to kind of generate a good idea of what that upper part of the main near the number two and three batten are supposed to look like. And it'll become obvious when it's too deep and too knuckle forward. And that's where you can get into trouble by over easing the uppers and that super light stuff. See, I could add to that in that, you know, I was really watching the upper leech tail tails and the, the top one stalled first most of the time until you got the mass too straight and that would hook the leech so much that then second and third telltales would stall first. So I think if the second and or third telltale is stalling before the top one, you've overdone it. You've, you've eased off the shrouds too much. It's all in, you know, it's all related to what you said. You get that knuckle forward look, but it's also hooks that leech in so much that it changes the profile. Yep. All right. Well, I wanted to keep this a little bit short. So um, I uh, just wanted to do one more thing with, you know, with our partners with Mark Setbot and pretty cool event that we did. I, if I could ask a couple of you guys for just a quick quote on what you think of the Mark Setbot and then we'll wrap things up. So I start since you're still on, Mike, you have a quick comment about the Mark Setbots? Yeah, I think they're pretty cool. Uh, I love to see them march across. You know, one of the really cool things about it was you could set all three at once, you know, like really quick course changes, but, you know, watching the, um, the offset go with the mark and thinking about how many race committees have to pull up a mark, move the race, the, the wind mark over, then go get the offset takes a lot of time. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, you know, I think the one thing that um, we could really benefit for next time, if we could somehow get somebody really calling the line full time, I think that would really help us. I think, it, you know, that's the thing it doesn't do is call the line. And I do think too, when we're not, you know, when we're not, don't have a post right on our committee boat, you know, we're, we're probably missing a few things here and there. It's not perfect calling when you're drifting around. Yeah. But I think yeah. they're awesome. Definitely. John Heaton. Uh, 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 the, the bots were great, Ed. Um, so uh, you guys did a great job with them. We also sailed Annapolis, a few, uh, the nudes maybe, or I forget which event with the bots as well. And they were, I think, great. Exactly what Mike said, the ability to set the reset, um, the line is just phenomenal. And uh, you know, if something's wrong as a race committee, you're not afraid to just stop, say, okay, let's postpone and reset the line real quick here, make it fair racing. So I, I think, they're, they're a great innovation. I, I'm glad, super happy that, you know, we're get, getting that here, Ed. Thanks for all the work you're doing with them. And thanks for the Mark Setbot uh, contributing them to the fleet as well. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Charlie McKee, can you give us a quick, just real quick comment about the Mark Setbots? Uh, yeah, it's way better. And why would you ever go back? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I think that the, uh, what one of the reasons why we sail these boats is that we like the idea that the quality of racing is high, but the ratio of sailing to doing other things is also high. And, uh, you know, this just fits perfectly with that. I mean, we were able to spend more time racing and less time waiting around, and it's just way better. Awesome. Thank you. Jonathan McKee. Yeah, I, uh, I think I gave you my quote earlier, but I'll say it again. There's no way that we would have gotten five races off on Saturday if not for the March that bot. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. George Zabo. Yeah, uh, same comments as everyone else. Uh, one addition to add is that Finishing and drifting conditions that last day, we saw an error, a possible error that, that you might want to add a button to the system. And what it was was that when the when they got to like two knots of breeze and the thing drifted a, a meter away, it would fire back up at four knots to get that one meter in. And if I was finishing really close to the mark, you could get hit by the mark as it motored up wind. So 
might need a button for drifting conditions or something else to motor more slowly. Um, our hand, hard input on that, but that was only criticism of the thing the whole weekend. I'm not sure anyone else even saw that on the race course. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, you almost just let him drift, um, but that's definitely something we talked about. Um, does anybody else want to make any comments? Um, I, a real quick thing for us um, in an ideal situation, and further on, you know, we will we will have a set you know race committee vote. Um, and there's different different things there. And, and as we improve and do different things, you know, this input's huge. Um, John, then, did you have another comment? Yeah, not related to the Marxette bot, but you bring up an interesting point. Um, and some classes have experimented with having it be legal to hit the marks. And I actually think it's quite a good idea because it just eliminates that whole area of uncertainty of uh, going around the Lord mark. Oh, you hit it. No, we didn't, you know. And does it really matter? I could, you're not going to gain by hitting it. So I would urge the J70 class or whoever, you know, maybe even for next regatta, why not just try it and see if people like it? Because I think we would like it. That's all I got to say. That's a very good point. Um, definitely. Because you know the mark's going to be going back to its spot if you do hit it. So, you know, you, you don't, it, it could hit you. Um, but, but that is a good, um, good idea. Very good idea. Um, so uh, definitely thank you for the input on everything. Um, you know, we want to keep doing this um, whenever we can or have to. And so, um, you know, please feel free to, to keep touching base with us. We'll be back, we'll be in Bacardi for those events uh, running the bots. And then uh, we'll see what happens in January with the Davis Island event, if it happens and how it happens, um, but we're here to support it. So. Um, if anyone doesn't have any other comments, um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. And we really are excited that we're sailing right now. <laughs> thanks, Ed. Yep. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you all in January <laughs> or next or this weekend. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks, Ed. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.